We have been talking over the last two weeks now of the idea of blessed assurance. That you can know that you know that you know Jesus Christ as your Savior. In the text that we're looking at this morning, John will give us three uh, tests that we can use in our own lives and the lives um, as we view other people as well. So, the first test that we talked about last week was the moral test. If you know that you know him, there's a moral test that we can do, and it's this. It's the moral test of obedience. Chapter 2, verse 3 through 6, talks about the idea that if, I'm, if I know him, I will keep his word. I will keep his commandments. We said last week that Bonhoeffer made this statement, only he who believes is obedient, and only he who is obedient believes. And so it's imperative for us to examine our own lives and understand that if I say that I know him, I can know that I know him, if in my heart and in my desire is to obey him. And again, this is not perfect obedience, but there's something within us that our spirit stirs that I know as I hear his word, I long to do it. I long to do it. John goes on to tell us that when we obey, it brings spiritual maturity. We are perfected in his love. I found this this week. It's by A.W. Tozer. Speaking of this topic, he says, The word of God, well understood and religiously obeyed, is the shortest route to spiritual perfection. And he's talking about not being perfect, but maturing in our faith and maturing in our love. So, obedience to his word, the shortest route to spiritual perfection. And we must not select a few favorite passages to the exclusion of others. Nothing less than a whole Bible will make a whole Christian. And so, we look to the word of God, and as we obey it, something happens. We grow we're matured, and our love for God is perfected. And then finally, in that section, verse 6, he then says this, If we say we abide in him, that I know him, I, I'm in him, I'm saved, I'm born again, we ought also to walk as he walked. To abide in him means to behave like him. So, before we move on this morning, let me caution every one of us this morning. We are accustomed many times to coming in on a Sunday morning and hearing a message and hearing the word and leaving and not doing what we heard. I pray this week that we were more conscientious of obedience in our lives. And we just said, yes, Lord. And if you didn't, then listen now. And when you leave here, add what I'm about to say, and do what we said last week, and leave with the sense of God, I will obey you. If you are in him, we will keep his word. So that's the moral test of obedience. Now, the new section is chapter 2, verse 7, and this is the second test. It is a social test, and and he's not going to get there right away. He's going to use about three verses before we know what he's talking about. But I'm going to give you the spoiler alert right now. The social test of how we know that we know him is love. How do I know that I know him? I obey him. How do I know that I know him? I love. And I love believers. So, look at verse 7 with me. He begins, brethren. And I love this. And and it's there, it's brethren, it can mean dear friends, but I, I think the, the favorite phrase of John, and it could be translated here as well, beloved. Beloved. When you read John, there's a real sense of his love for the people of God. There's a tremendous love for them. Beloved. And as he writes now in verse number 7, he is taking it for granted that they have already read his gospel. We believe that these epistles came later, later, and so he's he's talking to them now, and he's going to reference his gospel, the gospel of John, specifically chapter 13. So I I think he knows and is aware that they have been there. Here's what he says. My brother, my beloved, my dear friends, I write no new commandment to you, but an old commandment which you had from the beginning. And what he says is, hey, I'm writing now. I want you to know that you know 
And what I'm writing, though, is not new. It is an old commandment. It's old. It's old in two ways, because first and foremost, you heard this from the beginning. He says, what I'm about to tell you is old, because when you came to Christ, this is what you heard and what you ought to know. It's also old um, in an ancient way. I think so often in our lives we forget that the Bible of the early church was the Old Testament. And we do ourselves a disservice if we avoid the Old Testament. We cannot understand the new without knowing the old. And for Jesus himself, when he's on this planet, that was his Bible. That was his word. And and he pulls out, it's, it's as if, if you listen to Jesus, if you've been reading the Old Testament, he is just telling you exactly what the Old Testament says. Listen to Leviticus chapter 19. Verse 18, this is how this commandment is ancient and old. You shall not take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the children of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. You hear that before? Anywhere? That's Leviticus. So it's old in this sense. And so John says, I'm writing this commandment, and I want you to know it's old, and this is it. That love, well, he's going to talk about love, but it's, it's new in the idea of love. Um, and they had this from the beginning, this commandment. Um, love is what you should have heard about when you came to Christ. Not only the love of Jesus for you that we can scarcely comprehend, but that people who come to Jesus will not only love him, but Jesus will change them to be loving people. That's what they heard from the beginning. And it does make sense. Do you remember when Jesus, well, you don't remember, but if you read, right? If you read in the Gospels, I think it was Luke, when he, he's at a table with a Pharisee, he's welcomed in, and the Pharisee has him there. He doesn't kiss him to greet him. He doesn't wash his feet. And a woman comes in, and she just weeps over him and washes his feet with her tears and her hair. And Jesus says, i got a question for you, Simon. And he gives this story about someone who's been forgiven much, And at the end, Simon says, of course, someone who's forgiven much will love much. And that's what he missed. And in our lives this morning, this is an old commandment that we should have heard from the beginning. Because we have been forgiven much, my brother and sister this morning, do you understand what you've been forgiven of? Do you understand your debts that could not be paid? Do you understand that one stepped in your place your Savior. Well, this is what they had from the beginning. We've been forgiven much. We love much. So I'm not writing anything. This is old for you. You know this is old. Now, verse number eight, we, we, we are confused because John sounds confused. It sounds like, yeah, he's 90 years old and he's not making any more sense. And if you're 90, I'm not, I'm not okay, you sure you make sense. But listen to what he says in verse number eight. He just said, I'm not writing anything. It's an old commandment, which you've had from the beginning. Verse 8, again, a new commandment, I write you. Like, what? What? John, you just said it's an old commandment. But he says, a new commandment, I am writing you. He goes on to say, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. He says, Again, this is new. Yes, it's old in one sense, but it's new in another sense. One, one writer said that this concept of love is as old as the sun and as new as the dawn. And I think that's true. In which, in which way is it new? He tells us in verse number 8. He says, it is new which thing is true in him. The love now that John is talking about is old. It was from the beginning. They had it when they were saved, they understood it. But it's new now in Jesus Christ. How is that? Because God became flesh. And the God who is love took upon him flesh. And love walked among us. It's new in this way. Before we could understand vaguely, not too clear, but when God showed up, love was wrapped in humanity. That which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, which we have handled with our hands, the word of life. 
And when Christ came on this planet, love was revealed. It was tangible. It was deeper. It was stronger. It was expanded. It was astonishing. It was supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. Right? Because that's the word we made up to say, it's better than good. So this love is new that it's in Christ now. God became flesh for you and I. He showed us what love is about. But it's new in you, he goes on to say in verse 8. It's new in us. Because this love was unknown. But those of us who are in him are now to walk even as he walked. And so this love is new to us as well. And then he says at the end of verse 8, And in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. So, Christ is love. We see it, we experience it. That love resides in us. And then his plan is that this love sheds light. And so, as we know the love of Christ, as we practice the love of Christ, you and I, my brother and sister, are the ones who are pushing back the darkness of this world through the love of Christ. That is our calling today in a dark and dying world. I was reading some quotes by Martin Luther King Jr., and he said this, I know that love is ultimately the only answer to mankind's problems. That's true. But the way that's conveyed the way this world that is still lying in darkness sees light is when God's people who've experienced God's love share that in the world they live in. And so it's, it's old. It's old as the sun, sun. It's as new as the dawn. Verse number nine. This is the third he who says. Remember, and, and this is John's way to keep us going along with his train of thought. In verse number four, he said, he who says that I know him and doesn't keep his commandment, he's a liar. Verse 6 says, he that says that I abide in him, I ought to walk as he walked. And what he's saying, if, if you say this, this is the truth of the matter. If you're saying these things, this should be the outcome. Now verse number 9. He who says he is in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. So the, the person who says, I'm in the light, I know him, but I hate, I despise I have animosity toward my brother or my sister. John said, the truth of the matter is, no matter what you say, you're in darkness even until now. Now skip to number verse 11 because he's going to expand on this a little bit. About the idea of darkness. But he who hates his brother is in darkness. And remember, right, we know what darkness is like. Darkness can be scary, man. Like, really thick darkness. When I was in the service, we were in southern Germany um, in the Black Forest. They call it the Black Forest not because the trees are black, right? Because it's dark. It's, like, really, really dark. It's a darkness that you can feel sometimes. He says, if, if you're saying you love your brother or you hate your brother, you're not in the light. You're in darkness. It's a dark place. It's scary. It's chaotic. You walk in darkness. It means the manner of your life right now doesn't, it doesn't line up with the light. He goes on to say, and does not know where he's going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Now listen to what's being said. If I'm here this morning saying, I'm walking in light, I know that I know him, and yet as you sit here, there are brothers and sisters that you can't stand. that you hate, that you strongly dislike. And when their name is mentioned or their face is seen, you really can't stand it. John says, you're in darkness. Now think. You're in darkness. But now notice this at the end of verse 9. Until now. You don't have to stay there, nor can we stay there as believers. Now the heart of the matter, verse number 10, 
Here's a social test that we were privy to because I told you it was coming, but this is the truth now. He says, verse number 10, he who loves his brother abides in the light, and there is no cause for stumbling in him. I, I love what John does. He, he doesn't mess around. He, he's really stark in the contrast, right? He reminds us that there are only two allegiances. We want to divide our world into all these small little groups, but, but ultimately when you boil it down, there are only two allegiances. One, the world and darkness. That's the one, the world and darkness. The other is Jesus and light. And so, if you're sitting here, to hate your brother or sister means that you are part of the world, you're in darkness, and if you love your brother and sister, it means that you abide in the light, that there is no stumbling, you're not being tripped up in your life, the light goes before you, you truly do have love. And so he says in verse 10, he who loves his brother abides in light. So, this is probably a good question at this time, because um, what do you know of Christian love? What, what does that mean to you? Because we live in a world that tells us all love is love. And that's not true. It's not true. Some love is sinful. Some love is out of step with what God has commanded us for all people. And even in our own vernacular, we use love so many times. It's like, do we even know what we're saying? I can say to you this morning, I love cheeseburgers, and I do. There's something comforting about a good, juicy in the same breath I can tell you this morning I love my wife and I love my grandbabies I even slipped the other day it came out of my mouth I can't believe it I said I love the dog (laughs) no don't clap I'm in counseling right now right it's working it's quiet Joe um, but we know that there's, that's not the same. There's a difference there. And so as we, we look at John saying, if we love our brothers and sisters, we better know what he's talking about because we can be thinking cheeseburgers right now, and that's not what he's talking about. There's a different love here. So the best way to define it, I think, is to let John define it. Look at 1 John chapter 3, verse 16. By this we know love. So there, there's, no, there's no guessing now. Do you love your brother and sister in Christ? Okay. By this we know love. Because he laid down his life for us. How do we know real love this morning? Because we know that love came in the flesh and willingly laid down his life for us. No one took it from him. He willingly laid it down for you and for me. My friend, the gospel is the basis for all that we do. We had a woman years ago that quit coming to our church because they said, all they ever talk about is the gospel. And I said, amen. What, what else is there? This is the basis for everything that we do. Now listen, he just said, here's, here's how we know love. Love came down. Christ died for us. And we also ought to lay down our lives for the brothers and sisters. And then if you're, you're wondering what he's talking about, I got to die for them? Yeah. And listen to what he says. But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother or sister in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of, of God abide in him? If Christ gave everything for me... I ought to then be willing to give everything for my brothers and sisters in Christ. And they'll say, oh, I'll die for you. He's not asking you to die for them right now. He's asking you to live for them and give your stuff if they need it. To take care of their needs. And then he ends that section by saying this. My little children, let us not love in word or tongue, but in deed and in truth. Notice, he never said anything about our feelings there. He never said, hey, if you feel like loving your brother, if you're having a really great day, if you had eight hours of sleep, then you should love them. No, the feelings are not in there at all. Love is an action. And part of this being 
the body of Christ means that I love Jesus, but the way I show that is by loving one another. I don't think we get this. The church is a community. Think about how Jesus told us to pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now notice the transition. Give us. He could have said me. He didn't say me. Give us our daily bread. So if I'm praying, give us our daily bread, and I have daily bread, maybe there's a brother or sister who doesn't have daily bread, and maybe I should give them daily bread. When we talk of biblical love, it is self-sacrificial commitment to each other. To each other. To be for them, not against them. To put their needs in front of my own needs. This is biblical love. Now listen, I think we all know, oh, you should love people. You're a Christian. You should love everybody. And certainly that's the case. But that is not what John's concern is here. He has narrowed this down to believers. And and let's not just stop there. Because I think so often in our lives, it's like, yes, I love Christians. The Christians out there. Maybe you've had this experience where you were traveling or you sat next to a stranger and you started to talk and right, right away you sensed like, hey, I think they're a believer. Like you could, you, you sense that, yeah, we have something in common. And sure enough, they're believers and, and you understand that and recognize that. And we say, yes, I love believers out there. But what about believers in here? That you see, that you rub shoulders against, that you know them. That you have to see them every week. And if you're in our church doing communion once a month, you've got to be right with them. Is this thing on? Mike, oh, it's going to die. Okay, thank you for telling me. All right. Um, What about believers in here? Um, What John is saying to us this morning is extremely difficult. Let's be honest. Look around this room. And I'm serious. What he's saying is extremely difficult because the real church of Jesus Christ in a local way is like a family. This is, this is a family. And you know families. Whether they're perfectly intact or broken, there's dysfunction, right? And we, we all come out of this to, to where whether it's stepchildren, stepparents, single moms, single dads, Um, sibling rivalries happening. Um, Families can be messy. And then do the whole birth order thing, right? The firstborn, responsible for everything. Then the middle child, no one even knows their name. And then the babies, you know the babies, right? Yeah. And all of these things happening. And in that family environment or setting, you and I know you can be hurt. Like, really hurt. Some of you today have scars in your life because of your family. What was said or what was done. They don't go away. And so, so when we realize that in our own physical families, then we're brought into a church where, where we bring all this stuff with us. And it's, it, it is difficult. And just like a regular family that I'm comfortable with and I'll say things to, sometimes we say things to one another. And, and this is really the problem. Some of the most vitriolic language and savage language and unkind language comes from Christians speaking to Christians. But Christ has brought us into community. And he's brought us into a family that he wants to work out the dysfunction and he wants us to love one another with a self-sacrificial commitment to one another, moving towards one another, thinking of others better than ourselves, this is the church of Jesus Christ. And so, with that said, let me just give you three uh, concluding statements as way of application. Number one, in light of what we just read and what we've been reading, heed the word of God. John is telling the church, if you want to know that you know him, 
check out your life. Are you, is the trajectory of your life one of obedience and love for other people? And if you're sitting here this morning or listening online and you can't honestly say, yes, I, I fall, I stumble, I know it, I'm grieved, I ask for forgiveness, um, but that is the trajectory of my life. If, if you can't say that, then here's what John says. You're lost. You are without Christ. And I've been doing this long enough to know that people sit in church their whole lives and they think somehow they're just saved, but there's never any conviction of the Spirit. There's not, never any willingness to obey. There's not, never any real love for brothers and sisters. So heed the word of God. Examine yourself this morning. Don't just sit here and let this go over your head if you're saying, oh my God, darkness is part of my life. This is my nature. No, there's a problem there. Heed the word and examine yourself. Number two, hatred and Dehumanizing must desist. Again, I was this quote from Martin Luther King Jr. and he said, "Hatred is too great a burden to bear." And for the Christian, there's no place, there should be no place in our lives, and we see this in the world all around us. Can I tell you, this is an angry, hateful world. And we have been in some bubble. This is the reality. And those simple dislikes and hostilities, those small seeds of hatred, they grow. They grow. They create blindness and eventually become barbaric. Sometimes we're confused by Jesus' statements, right? Because he says things that are to shock us and to alarm us. He does it for a reason. But when he says, if you hate your brother without a cause, he calls it murder. And you might think that's ridiculous. But that hatred, that seed of hatred, if it's allowed to grow, it does cause murder. It always causes murder. We live in a world where we have seen people hate other groups and dehumanize them. And it never ends well. Nazi Germany looked at a Jew as a dog. They dehumanized a class of people. And when they did, it made way for the extermination of six million Jews. Which did happen. Quit with the, the changing of history. The Holocaust was real. Those people died under the hands of barbaric Nazis. The same happened in the Pacific Rim. The, the, Chinese, the Chinese who were tech, or the Japanese, the, the Japanese um, soldiers and generals in statements viewed the, the Chinese as pigs. And they made statements to say, I can butcher a pig and feel nothing just like I would a Chinese person. And in seven weeks in Nanking, in seven weeks in Nanking, the Japanese slaughtered between 200 and 400,000 people. We need to be careful. The hatred in our hearts, those seeds that we dehumanize and we label people, they must desist. We are quick to judge others. We are quick to categorize others. We are quick to put them in our boxes. And Jesus has something to say about this. Look at Matthew chapter 7. This is, and we'll just breeze through this quickly, but it's worth looking at. Jesus says, judge not that you be not judged. And, and everybody in the world knows this verse. Everybody outside the church use it. Don't judge lest you be judged. But you understand we make judgment calls every day. We do have a moral compass. We're supposed to make judgment calls on what's right and what's wrong. He's not talking about that. He's talking about the way that we do judge people. The way that it's done. And he says, judge not that you be not judged. We look at people and we work, right away we categorize them. We put them in a box. We, we know why they do what they do. We make assessments and judgment calls that we should never make. And we, again, see this in our world today. People are defined by what you disagree with. 
And that's it. Because when you label a person and you call them this, you have just deprived them of humanity. Because now we don't have to look at them like human beings who are made in the image of God, who are breathing, living souls, but they're this. And that's a dangerous place to be. They're just truckers. Now listen to me. That statement in itself, they're just truckers. And you can think what you want about the next rant I'm going on. I couldn't care less. Honestly, they're just truckers. Do you know what? I know a lot of truckers. And some of them, they're not good people. They're just not. But the majority that I know are good, hardworking men and women who love their families and are just trying to put food on the table. And when I say those truckers, what I've just done is I have demonized an entire class of people. And now I don't have to treat them like they're human anymore. Those police. Those police. Are there bad police officers? Yes. And they're dealt with. They're, they're dealt with. We see them dealt with. But I know way too many good police officers who really love people and they're holding a line in a thankless job. A thankless job. That no one cares about until you need them. And when you do, you want them showing up, not protesters. Honestly, those politicians, it's getting worse, so just hang with me. <laughs> those politicians, well, what have you just done? Listen, are there some nasty politicians? Yes. Are there some evil politicians? Yes, we see one right now in Russia. But it's unjust what Putin has just done. It's greed, it's evil, it's wickedness. Yes, there's bad politicians, but I have to tell you, I know some good men and women who really are serving their community who are trying to do the best that they can. But when you classify them and you label them, you dehumanize them, and so they're no longer a living, breathing, human soul. That pastor, don't even go there, never mind. I'm not gonna, I'm gonna, right? I'm serious. I'm going to be off the camera probably, but doesn't it? Look it. Start looking at human beings and eyes and faces of people who are living souls. Listen, they are created in the image of God, and what are we doing? And we can get on our hobby horse, and we can call them whatever, and we can dehumanize them. But these people, those people, are living souls. All of them. We better be careful about this. Jesus warns his people about this very thing. And here's what we do. We stand in judgment, and we believe that we see it all, we know it all, we know their thoughts, we know their motives, we know why they do what they do. And then we act like it's Jesus and I standing here, and Jesus says, yeah, that guy, you're right. <laughs> uh, he's not saying that. He goes on to say something else for us. Um, look what he says in, in uh, chapter 7 of, of Matthew. Judge not lest you be judged. For what, what judgment you judge, you'll be judged. What measure you meet, you'll be meted to you. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye, and look, at it, and look, a plank is in your own eye. Hypocrite, first remove the plank from your own eye, and you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. That picture that Jesus paints for his disciples is hilarious. It's, it's, it's a guy who has a piece of dust or a small bug in his eye, a speck, and you know how it's irritating, but ah, I can't see, it's watering. And a guy comes up with a, with a telephone pole in his head. Honestly, it's, this is the idea. It's like, it's this huge plank. And he looks up at his brother and he swings his plank to tell him, there's a speck in your eye and I need to deal with that. Now listen to me. Notice, Jesus didn't say this brother or sister didn't have a speck in their eye. They most certainly had a speck in their eye. And it has to be dealt with in love, and because love tells the truth. But notice what he says. How do you know he has a speck in his eyes? Because you're using your eye, which has what in it? 
a big piece of wood. Our perception is not right. And it's easy to notice everything else and everyone. And we do this with our people we like, our friends, our family, our group. They can do the most terrible things and we excuse it. And someone else does something minor and we're all over them. And Jesus says, hey, listen, that big plank sticking out of your head is a problem. And before you deal with the the speck, it has to be dealt with. Maybe that two by four hanging out your head should be looked at. And maybe you don't see it clearly. And, And maybe, just maybe, you don't have the mind of God to know why they did what they did, where they come from, their background, and what's happening in their life. My brother and sister, we have become beamers. Really, beamers. And, and this plank has to be dealt with. And the way it's dealt with is, I go to Jesus. And I say, Lord, examine my own heart, my own mind, my own ways, my own motives, my own thoughts, my own actions. Let me see my heart in the light of your holiness. And you know, when a sinner comes to Jesus, he doesn't treat them like we see this individual treating this brother or sister. He welcomes them and forgives them and cleanses them. And so, this is what Jesus has done for us. This is what we we must do in the lives of our brothers and sisters. It humbles us because Jesus truly does know why we do what we do. He knows the motives of the heart. And yet when we come running to him, in our weakness, in our sinfulness, in our stupid decisions that we made, he offers forgiveness. One person said, if God can reconcile with a sinner, you can reconcile with a saint. And we have been reconciled. So, heed the warning, hatred and dehumanizing must decease. And finally this morning, we must humbly lay down our life for the sake of love and, and humility. Love and unity, I'm sorry. This is what Christ has done for us. Jesus Christ, the perfect, spotless Son of God, laid down his life for you and me. And he's calling each of us to lay our lives down for one another. And you say, Rick, it's not fair. I was hurt. They said, this is what happened to me. And you're right. Sometimes it's not fair. It's not but it wasn't fair for Christ. He did nothing wrong. And we're called to lay our lives down and absorb the pain, absorb the grief, absorb the hurt, and love one another. We must die to ourselves for the sake of love and unity. Not my way, not my opinion, not my stuff. I'm part of the family of God. And as I love God and love one another, it shouts to the world the truth of the gospel. Listen, Church of Jesus Christ, this is difficult because we have misunderstandings, we say hasty things, we react the wrong way, we treat people unfairly, we're unkind, and it happens in the church. And if you're coming here and you think it's not going to happen, I'm just telling you, within a few weeks it will happen. Just the other day I had to go and apologize to a brother I love dearly because I said something I shouldn't have said. And I had to go humble myself and ask for forgiveness. This is the nature of the church. Because love and unity is that important. And so if I'm saying this morning, I am in the light. I know him. He saved me. He, he redeemed me. He loved me when I was unlovely. He called me to himself. If I'm saying that, then I need to be loving my brothers and sisters in Christ. I'll close with this illustration. Um, you, everybody, I'm sure, knows Charles Haddon Spurgeon, the great preacher of London. Um, but maybe you don't know, during the same time, Joseph Parker was another pastor in London, and, and a, a fantastic. They're both great preachers in London during the same time. And Joseph Parker was preaching on a Sunday, and he, he mentioned the impoverished condition of the children welcomed into Spurgeon's orphanages. And Spurgeon was, had a heart for his orphanages, just like Mueller. And he, he mentioned the impoverished condition of the children who were coming. But what Spurgeon heard was the impoverished condition of the orphanage, and not the children. So, the godly man, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, got up on Sunday morning and preached against Parker 
and what he said. I mean, just the, the message was about Parker saying that he personally attacked him from the pulpit. And in those days, sermons were written in the paper. So a sermon's written, all of London is reading it, and they're seeing, here is Spurgeon attacking Parker. And, it, you know, it's a soap opera, right? We just get sucked into that. On Sunday morning, Parker's church was completely packed. Because they wanted to hear the response now since Spurgeon had attacked him wrongfully. And here's what happened. Parker stood up to a packed congregation and said, I believe this is the day that Mr. Spurgeon is out of the pulpit and they usually take an offering for the orphanage. Today, we will take a love offering for that orphanage. They emptied the plate three times. What did Parker do? He died to self. My brother and sister, it's time to die to self. To die to self. And this morning, some of you folks, you need to make things right. Just make them right. I'm sorry. Forgive me. I was wrong. And if someone comes to you like that, you know what you do? You forgive them. Yeah, I know, and I've been waiting for this all my... Shut up. Just, just like, again, get the beam out of your head, because you've sinned against people millions of times. you sin against God more than anyone will sin against you. You forgive, and you love, and you restore. This is a Christian life of repentance and faith. And so this morning, if I say, I walk in the light, I have to love my brother. He who loves his brother abides in the light. I've been enjoying... I've always enjoyed the Puritans. I've enjoyed Thomas Godwin, but, but Sibbs is my favorite. He's my favorite Puritan. Um, they call him the heavenly Dr. Sibbs. And someone said of Sibbs, there was heaven in him before he was in heaven. Wouldn't that be a great title for us? That brother and sister, there is heaven in him before they ever got to heaven because they loved the Savior and they loved one another. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning. We thank you for your kindness, your grace, your strength, your mercy in our lives. We thank you that we have a Savior who laid down his life for us. And Lord, we forget. We forget our sin. We forget our guilt. We forgive, forget the punishment that we deserve. And then we act as God ourselves. Forgive us. Lord, humble us. Help us to see the gospel and, and what it means in our lives. And Lord, help us to be willing as we take her, as we have Um, misunderstandings, that we deal with them in a a fashion, in a manner that pleases you, that we love, we forgive, we truly walk in the light, we love one another. And so, Lord, continue to do a work in our midst. Lord, help us to have the courage to obey you and to love you and love one another, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.